Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we're discussing how public media organizations are evolving, modernizing, and addressing today's challenges of how to best serve the public, while also dealing with challenges of how to deal with disinformation, people living in separate media bubbles, and programming controversies. Our special guests today are Rob Dunlap, President and CEO of Cascade Public Media of the Pacific Northwest, Amanda Mountain, President and CEO of Rocky Mountain PBS in Colorado, and Kurt Misch, President and CEO of PBS Reno of Northern Nevada. I'm so I'm so happy to to be here together. You know, we started this show with PBS stations like yours. And we went around to the different PBS stations in order to cast a light on the nonprofits in the ecosystems all around the country. And we just had such wonderful collaborations. And when COVID hit, we had to move over to Zoom. And now the entire media landscape has changed. So it would just be great to go around the table, starting with you, Kurt, and um, talk a bit about how that media landscape has changed for you and how you continue to advance your own nonprofit mission of serving your communities. Kurt, you want to take it away? Well, thank you, uh, Mark, very much, and appreciate the invitation to to join in uh, today. Uh, the the whole COVID and, and social media and Zoom uh, has provided us with such a level of flexibility uh, an ability to further engage with our audiences uh, using a number of the of the social platforms. We've been able to uh, send and receive information and engage in, in conversations that we had never been able to do before or had only been able to do on a, on a limited basis. Uh, Zoom enables us to do so many creative things, uh, including uh, helping our staff uh, our team make best use of their time uh, working uh, in many cases from home uh, uh, or remotely just as just as you're doing. So it's uh, it's really been uh, we, we've been able to make lemonade out of lemons. Uh, I mean this this could have really uh, created some serious challenges and and in reality it's uh, it's worked out to our benefit. Have you seen it as a net positive? Yes, we have. And 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 uh, Robert, how do you see it? Do you see this as a net positive? Uh, you know, it's it, I, I'm very interested in in Kurt's um, assessment here because um, I think that we have it within our power to take, as you say, Kurt, uh, lemonades make lemon uh, uh, lemons and make lemonade out of it. But it it seems to have also cascaded in a way across the the uh, the PBS field and the public media field in a way that that caused a lot of consternation. How do you see it at Cascade? I do see it much the same way. I think that, uh, you know, the pandemic has been catalytic on a number of fronts in terms of the adoption of uh, new ways of thinking. I guess they say crisis is the mother of invention. And so when you find yourself in uh, challenging moments, uh, you're looking for those ways in which you can leverage that moment into new ways of thinking. I think it has helped us uh, in a change management process with our team to think very differently. It's helped us to engage with communities in ways we wouldn't have otherwise in terms of being able to bring more people into some of the work that we do uh, that we perhaps just wouldn't have pushed ourselves to do previously because uh, we were you know, in a model in which, you know, we were uh, always driving toward in-person gatherings where perhaps those uh, those community conversations might be smaller, whereas just as you've done, you've been able to expand uh, the audience size uh, simply by being able to leverage uh, some of these tools. So I think technology uh, has done a lot to accelerate uh, changes in media overall, and it's helped to accelerate our work as well in terms of how we spread our mission in more positive ways throughout our community. Amanda, how do you see it uh, from where you sit? 
Yeah, I think that public media has a legacy of being relevant, particularly in times of national crisis. And the pandemic is no better example of that. All right, I, as everyone is, is articulating, I would agree our station and our business, in fact, is really well positioned to help combat social isolation, build cultural bridges, make sure that we can provide a lifeline to trusted information that people need, especially when the stakes are as high as during COVID. So many people in our communities were losing their lives and public media was the one place people could trust to learn more and get more comfortable about vaccines, to engage in the public health system in ways that they might not have felt comfortable otherwise. And so I think public media and our relevancy was on full display during COVID certainly and after. You know, you you raise such an important point that public media has for so long been a trusted neutral, um, perhaps um, by some people with a point of view uh, a little bit more on the um, on the uh, side of, of, of uh, looking at social change rather than um, than um, keeping things the way they are. Um, do you find that you are trusted in this fraught landscape? Uh, there's been so much uh, uh, information and disinformation, so much argument about simple things like uh, wearing masks during a health crisis. Um, how, how are you dealing with that kind of a situation event? First and foremost, we did we've done a lot of work over the years to ensure that the staff on our teams are reflective of the communities that we're serving. And so as we were having internal conversations about our own safety policies, we were going through that same negotiation um, that our community was going through, quite frankly, when there was a disagreement and the spectrum of beliefs were broad. And that, um, you know, when we're able to build trust internally within our organizations because our staffs are diverse and reflective of the communities that we're aiming to serve, we are better positioned to build and expand the public trust in ways that are sustainable and powerful. Yeah. We like public media uh, are, I'm, I'm sorry, Rob, you want to say something? Well, I was just, I was just going to amplify some of Amanda's remarks. I mean, I think there are so many divides in our nation right now around all different vectors, uh, social, civic, political uh, factors. And I think that flight to trust and credibility has never made public media more relevant uh, than it is today. Now, that's not to say we don't have the challenges that go with also operating at a very congested uh, media landscape where distribution and content have been, you know, sort of uh, dis you know, dis disaggregated from one another. Uh, and there's a lot happening in that space where discovery is challenging and so forth. But the mission of what public media does in terms of bringing communities together and using the tools of media for, for good uh, and really to try to amplify and lift up voices in our communities, I think we've never been more relevant than we are right now. People uh, depend on us. And people depend on us in ways that they don't automatically depend on other media outlets. There's a, there's an emotional uh, connection, uh, an emotional uh, dependence on public media, and and uh, that trust, uh, that 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 halo effect that we talk about all the time. Um, we certainly don't have uh, anchors. Uh, admitting in the media that they presented misinformation that they knew was misinformation. Uh, that does not happen uh, with public media. I, 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 I'm so glad you went there. You know, like public media, we as a organization that recruits nonprofit leaders and then draws attention to their work, we don't do any party politics, none. But we do have a sense of what American and democratic values are about, of course. And those include that if you're going to report something, that you actually believe it's true. You got I draw a connection Absolutely. between what's going on with the Dominion lawsuit with the willful dissemination of false information and some of the other things that we're seeing in social media. Uh, do you draw similar connections? And how do we heal that? as part of the mission of, of trying to keep faith with the public with, that has divergent views. So we don't want to press onto the public any, we don't want to become a propaganda mechanism, mm -hmm. but how do you actually become this, this marketplace that we were in the past in this changing media landscape, Kurt? 
Well, it's a good question. I think, you know, I do think there is on the commercial side of media uh, and, uh, you know, there's a there's a business model challenge that is almost toxic. And I think we see it in what is taking place in the political arena today, where we've got certain political figures for whom you know, their presence on media and commercial media is the oxygen they need and for whom coverage of that figure or figures uh, end up becoming part of the business model of what feeds their work. And so they feed on each other in a very, uh, I think, you know, somewhat destructive way when it comes to the norms we think of when we think about the purpose and the role of of what media is supposed to do in the communities we serve. And that's where I think that flight to credibility and safety and trust, you know, amplifies kind of the work that we do across public media, because we don't double down on on uh, on that kind of work. And instead, we stick to, uh, you know, really threading that needle very carefully around the journalistic integrity of what we do and how that uh, best serves audiences in our community. We are not oriented around how we can line our pockets or the pockets of our ownership. We're oriented around how we can return value to our community. It's a kind of a return on impact instead of a return on investment. And so, you know, I think that's how public media is wired. And I think that's where, as this world gets more complicated and congested around these uh, sorts of civic and social issues, public media will, uh, you know, continue to stand out more as a, a, a bit of a beacon, if you will, uh, for many uh, parts of our community who are seeking just the, the, the calm and straight story. I think that's and- Mainline uh, mainline media is just as much at fault. It seems that sometimes uh, some of our our journalistic uh, colleagues in the for profit media um, they, they they basically spin up these arguments and just and, and spin up these the, these conflicts in order to also attract uh, attract attention. Kurt, Amanda, uh, what are your comments on this? And how do we avoid you know if if conflict causes interest? And conflict engages audiences. How do we engage audiences without being part of that sort of ridiculous uh, fake conflict ecosystem? Well, I think that we stay true to our uh, model, to our business model, as, as Rob indicated. We say all the time that, you know, we can, uh, reasonable people can disagree reasonably. Uh, And by modeling that performance in the content that we produce, by listening carefully, Uh, we talked about social media and some of those some of those platforms a few minutes ago, the ability that has given us to listen, to hear uh, individuals and groups that we may not have seen as easily before is a is a terrific tool. And we are equipped to respond to that because we don't have to worry about what's going to sell uh, or what the uh, what the uh, return on the uh, dollar investment is going to be to the degree that the the commercial people do. We don't we don't have that pressure uh, that 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 financial leverage uh, hanging over our heads, and so we have the freedom to do what's correct, what's right. So we got a question, Amanda, from Deborah Holcomb, which uh, I'm just I'm just going there right now, and it, it's very it's very interesting. Uh, she comes from a fundraising background, and there there are certifications uh, for various uh, professions, and it seems that up till now we've all gone on the assumption that journalism, news, uh, even uh, media has a certain code of ethics, but it's sort of an unwritten. Code of Ethics. The the question is: Is it time right now to actually bring that dialogue out to the uh, out to the fore? And I hope I'm being uh, I'm keeping faith with Deborah's uh, question. Uh, do we start looking at what our standards are, publishing our standards for broadcast um, in a way that is not suppressive of voices and and different voices and different perspectives? but also has some sort of baseline ideas. I think it was Robert or uh, no, Kurt originally said, you know, I, I never thought I would see the day when, when people were actually 
putting forth information that they themselves disbelieve, right? Uh, is it time now, Amanda? And can public media lead the way? Absolutely. I think that first and foremost, um, we have collectively between local NPR stations and local PBS stations, thousands of locally owned and operated media organizations and communities around the country who are already adopting and publishing trusted um, code of ethics. And so many organizations within our public media system have already made what those accountability metrics are and pledges to the community transparent by publishing those code of ethics. And I would also say that as the largest by far locally owned and operated media organization and system in the country, we also have a beautiful system of accountability with our business model. You know, we are a membership organization, which is dependent on people trusting us enough to voluntarily contribute, be an investor, even though they can get all of our content for free. And so that is a check and balance in the way that we are structurally built and continue to sustain ourselves that holds us accountable to behaviors that will earn and sustain the public trust. That is such a great point, isn't it? Um, that that membership, that idea of citizen involvement. So in part, it's up to us, right? We have to be engaged. We have to not go for the cotton candy of of easy confirmation of our pre baked beliefs, right? Kurt, Rob. Yeah, absolutely. I you know I think that one of the things the general public sees so much on particularly twenty four seven cable channels is a blurring of the line between journalism and opinion. It, you know, most of the programs you see in those environments are talk shows in which hosts are you know are espousing their opinions, uh, which is permissible, of course. But when it's under the banner of news, then it suddenly gets very confusing. And that line between journalism and opinion has blurred so much so that the general public doesn't see the difference. And I think public media works really hard to focus on journalism and we don't do opinion. We don't get into that space. We try to inform and engage our communities. And uh, it's a it's a huge opportunity uh, for us to further our work in that area because of, of that confusion that exists out there generally. I think it's important also just to bring to the forefront um, some level checking. Oftentimes when public media is compared to, let's say, cable news, it is missed that cable news actually has very small audiences by comparison. With public media, one in four Americans are tuning into their local NPR station or watching some type of PBS content every single week. That's one in four Americans. That is a massive reach that also demonstrates our ability to engage people across spectrums of belief to build those bridges to trustworthy facts and information and cultural understanding. How do you keep a balance on, on other types of programming? For example, educational programming, and I'll take a very simple, um, uh, I'll take two simple examples. Um, the whole idea of, of teaching virology, right? Which, you know, coming out of COVID, that became very very uh, science around virology and immunization and so on and so forth became very controversial all of a sudden. Or things like evolution, right, to some people who believe in a different uh, approach. Um, do you get issues where you just try and teach things and people are really upset with how you, uh, the programming that you do, not news programming, but educational programming, which is at the core of your mission, Kurt? You get that on, on occasion. We'll get uh, feedback from folks that say, "Well, you were teaching that uh, evolution stuff on Nova," you know, right. and we're quick to point what out that do? there's a that there's a balance, uh, and that uh, you'll see uh, creationism uh, mentioned in programming as well. Uh, it's it's that balance between all of the the different programs and program sources that we do, uh, we have a, a very highly developed uh, educational outreach uh, with uh, educational workshops uh, done in schools pre-K through fourth grade. Uh, we make sure there's a, there's a wonderful balance in there with all of the different lessons and PBS kids videos that we take out. So does that does that mean that you don't have a point of view on these uh, matters or does it mean that you try to 
uh, give your audience access to the best that um, that this diverse community has to offer and let them decide. How do you how do you look at that? Just just like just like with the journalism that we've been discussing, we may all have our uh, particular points of view, Mark, but uh, that's not for us to espouse. Uh, we're there to present these different uh, facts or thought processes so folks can decide for themselves uh, what they're what they want to believe. Yeah, absolutely. I think when we when we look at some of the programming we present, you know, what we're trying to do is encourage people to think, to think and inspect and and understand the world around them, not tell them how to think or what to think, but just to consider and discover. And uh, through that discovery, uh, they will either deepen their own, you know, presumptions, or uh, perhaps they will find something new about uh, the subject matter that expands their world. How do you deal with um, the changing tastes and demographics of your market? You know, one of the things that really strike strikes me is that. In the early days of public television, just like all other media, it was primarily white, right? And it was primarily people who were abled in a standard way. In other words, you didn't see people in wheelchairs. You didn't see people who were blind uh, on uh, presented. And the first uh, programs that I remember uh, really breaking through that were, were programs like um, uh uh, Sesame Street and Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood and the, the children's programming. Um, now, your your audiences and the sensibility is really changing around you. You have so many different um, uh, people of different cultures and different attributes to, to deal with. Um, how do you ensure that you're trying to address the needs of your full audience, not just a segment of it that happens to be... Um, to have enough money to actually contribute, right? I mean, that's part of it, right? If you're if you're going to have members, they're going to have a certain profile. So, how do you make sure that you're you're serving your membership or that is not your members? Do you see what I'm saying, Amanda? I do. And um, to go back to the stat earlier that we talked about, one in four Americans sampling some type of public media each week, only 3% of that collective audience are active members in a local public media organization. And it, like you're saying, it is tempting to super serve that 3%. And there is this huge opportunity with the 97% of our audience that is more diverse age-wise politically, geographically, and all the different ways um, that well, audience- urban, urban uh, folks in different settings with different uh, life skills and jobs and experiences. So that's interesting that you're, you're actually delving into the people who aren't your members as much as you're delving into the people and perhaps even more. Oh, since absolutely. you only have 3%. Well, and the good news is that our members are, um, they're curious. They want to um, be exposed to different um, uh, cultures, beliefs. They, they, they are coming to us po- for that education, provocation, and um, they stay with us as we're exploring how to serve our bigger audience. And I do think there's an opportunity that we are experimenting with to change the definition of member. Currently, members um, is a synonymous term with donor, and it does focus our attention at that small percentage of members. For our station, it's roughly 9% of our audience are members. And we want to create um, an environment of belonging with our larger audience as a whole, knowing that once people feel they belong, they are more likely to invest. And that is from the inside out. It's how are we engaging in conversations with our communities? How are we meeting the needs of our communities through the products we create, the journalism that we um, that we develop? And then how are we staying in constant conversation to be in true co-ownership with the communities that we're aiming to serve? It's just so fascinating. Uh- uh, Kurt, and I'm going to give uh, Rob the last word here. Uh, Kurt, in terms of, of your future plans, how do you see the organization expanding? Are you investing in different ways going into the future so that you're positioned to serve an internet-based audience? Are you thinking still geographically um, a, a, as much as you did previously? How, how are you evolving? Yes, yes, and yes. 
<laughs> uh, <laughs> we're we're working on we're working on all of those on all of those fronts. We have a a, a very large geographic area that we serve. Uh, that uh, you know, we're we're here in a in a in a modern growing uh, university town, uh, five minutes outside of the city limits. You've got farms and ranches and mines and uh, uh, high desert land. Uh, Forty minutes to the west, you've got Lake Tahoe and that whole community, kind of the the Bay Area East. Uh, if you will, and so we have this amazing mixture of of, of people uh, that we have to be in contact with and listen to. Uh, so we look at the products we're producing for on air. We're looking at repurposing uh, a lot of those things for online uh, platforms. We've uh, produced our first digital first uh, series. Uh, we are uh, completing construction of a podcast booth uh, that is going to be sitting in in a in a large food hall in the central part of town part of the the redevelopment of that part of town and so we're going to be able to do our own podcasts and also rent that podcast booth out in a in a very uh, trendy if you will hip uh, portion of town with an amazing cross section of people so we're going to be able to to touch all of these areas with our products and our promotion. I mentioned our education. Uh, we're in seven counties with our educational program. Uh, we touched 72,000 children uh, in the previous school year. We've added robotics to this. Yeah, I could go on and on and on, but, but, but the point is uh, uh, listening to those communities, hearing what they have to say, engaging with them in uh, ways that are meaningful and important to them is what helps us move forward and, and, and helps to secure our future. And the Pacific Northwest, Rob, um, I'm sure you're not uh, just sort of nodding off and falling asleep as, as the world changes around you. What, how are you evolving? So we uh, have moved very aggressively over the last several years in producing uh, shorter form content, content essentially for every distribution platform out there first. Uh, we don't produce 30 and 60 minute episodic uh, you know, programming anymore. We do everything for uh, the digital environment. Uh, we have uh, developed apps across you know, all the major streaming services. We're doing newsletters. We're doing podcasts. We are seeking every opportunity we can to connect with that next generation of audience wherever they are spending their time. And the very grassroots uh, efforts that both Kurt and Amanda have talked about in terms of getting out and asking our communities, what do you need? How can we help? And, and really trying to bring that information in in a way that informs not only the content we create, but how we convene our communities. I, so, so it's almost as, as the world becomes you know, more digitized and more technology oriented, bringing that high touch component as well is where public media really should and can marry those two things in a beautiful way that helps uh, actually inform and involve our community to make the world a better place. So, so important. Um, I have a bit of breaking news to share with you all. Uh, just from my experience, I'm in New York, so I'm going to break some news that is not has nothing to do with politics or Trump or, or whatever. Um, the hotel that I'm staying at has just been acquired by the city of New York. That's one of the reasons why I had some difficulty. The, the Wi-Fi was down and so on. And it's being acquired from the city of New York to house people who are being uh, bussed up to New York City from the southern border. Um, and they are asylum seekers and refugees of various sorts and so on. Um, and the, the city is trying to figure out ways to house these people. So this is a community response to a national problem. And I think together, if we, if we do our job as Americans, right, we inform each other, we try to tell the truth, we try to share, and we try to solve together. Uh, we, can, we can have such a future as is unimaginable. The, the greatest days of America are still ahead of us, but it depends on, on us, the people, you, 
uh, to help us be informed to take those actions. Rob Dumlop, President and CEO of Cascade Public Media, Amanda Mountain, President and CEO of Rock Mountain, uh, PBS, Kurt Misch, President and CEO of PBS Reno. Thank you so much. And please thank your staffs, your boards, your funders, your members, and all the people who contribute to your programming. This is just such an important, important part. And by the way, Amanda, I am one of those people who tune in to PBS or NPR every single day. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Mark. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate it.